thank you very much for coming along and thanks for having me talk about a subject which I think is one of the most interesting of the Isle of Man. I think if there was a good talk on Manx folklore, it would be the most interesting talk out there. So I should probably apologise now that probably this is not it tonight. <laughs> However, I'm going to aim high and I'll try and give you five good things. I'm going to try and confuse the island's heroes beyond recognition. I will identify a began even more famous than the one at St Trinian's. I will redefine genie as something other than a witch. I will upset the majority of young girls in the Isle of Man today. And I'll uncover a type of story I expect you will not be expecting tonight. Um, and I'm going to do this by talking about five aspects of Manx folklore. And I didn't really know what I was talking about when I made up the title. It just sounded quite good. But I've discovered that what I'm talking about tonight, I'm going to talk about five different figures or types of Manx folklore. And to each of those, I'll give at least one good story. I'll say something interesting or unusual about each of those characters. And I'll give an aspect or a thing to understand about folklore in the Manx context more widely. Which is nice. But it means that we won't be able to talk about Manx folklore through time, nor by locations, nor by particular collectors, which is a shame, because the story of Manx folklore changes through time and by location and by who you're talking to or listening to. However, we don't have enough time, so let's get some glister on us and look at the first character, giants. Now, it might surprise some people that I would talk about giants as the first subject. But 300 years ago, this subject would be a massive one for Manx folklore because it was thought that giants, it was a very, very common belief that giants existed in the Isle of Man and there were a lot of giant stories 200 years ago. And these stories were used to explain or to talk about things in the Manx landscape which needed explanation. Either they were too old or too impressive or too strange to be explained by normal human beings. And so you'll find the castles of the Isle of Man explained by giants, or these sorts of standing stones explained by giants. I hope people will know this one outside Port Erin. Port Erin is a town down south if you've ever been there, <laughs> but it exists. And this is just on the outside of it. It's, it's called the Giant's Quoiting Stone. And there's actually two of these stones. One is very publicly here in the field, and another is about 300, 200 metres away. But it's hidden in someone's garden these days. And so you cannot see it except for in their house. And the story is that two giants were competing to see who could throw their stone the furthest. One of them threw it here, and the other threw it up the way. And that's why they're called giants' quoiting stones. Oh, I should say, giants are not just in the past. People think that giants are still with us. And so if you go down the right sort of cavern or cave, particularly under, underneath Laxey Mine or Castle Russian, you're likely to meet a giant down there sleeping or just waiting for the time of heroes to be back with us. So... There's a advice for the next time you're doing some speleology. I only say that to show off that I know the word speleology. Giants were also used to explain the round mounds of the Isle of Man. And I find it quite amazing that these Bronze Age burial grounds were known still to be places for the dead. Even millennia after they were in use, people knew that they were where dead people were buried. And so... Of course, if you look at places like this, Cronk, Cronk, Gookley, sorry, Gookley, uh, on Burke, you would have known that this is a place where people were buried. But of course, if you look at these large mounds, they can't be normal human beings. They would have to be giants. Which is quite amazing to think of. Because if you look on the old OS maps, where round mounds are named they tend to be called giant's grave. And so, going on the assumption that all old round mounds used to have names, and we've forgotten most of them, then probably you'd be forgiven for thinking that in the past they would all have been thought of as giant's graves. 
which paints the Isle of Man very differently. If people in the past thought that it was full of graves for giants, and pretty much anywhere in the Isle of Man you can see a round mound, even from here you can see round mounds, and so in the past people would have been within sight all the time of graves of who they of giants who they thought were in these places which really kind of illustrates what we're talking about here and this isn't a silly sort of belief and it's illustrated by a wonderful story from here this is old kirk braddon braddon's a place down south if you don't know it by the way <laughs> but there's a lovely story from george waldron in the 1720s he was an english fella who was over here and he wrote what became to be seen something like a tourist book. And so in the 1720s, he gives this account. Here, in justice to these poor people, he means the Manx, I must acquaint my reader that however strange their tradition may seem of the island being once inhabited by giants, my own eyes were witness of something which does not a little keep it in countenance. As they were digging a new vault in Kirk Braddon churchyard, there was found the leg bone of a man very near four foot in length, from the ankle to the knee. Nothing but ocular demonstration could have convinced me of the truth of it, but the natives seemed little to regard it, having, as they said, frequently dug up bones of the same size. They told me that but a few months before my arrival, there was found under Kirk Arbury churchyard a human head of that monstrous circumference that a bushel would hardly cover it, and that nothing was more common when digging than to throw up rigs, ribs, and hands conformable to the leg I had seen. And so if we imagine a shin bone to be four foot high, I imagine it's about that high, and if that's just the shin, then you can easily imagine the giant's head poking through the roof here. And this is the sort of person who the, who, would have been thought to have been all around us in the Isle of Man. And we said before that giants are attributed important things, such as the building of Peel Castle. Um, and this merging of important or great things with giants is not just by chance. Because the Manx word uh, for big, which is more, has... Um, it's vague as to whether it means physically big or big in stature and importance. I say this nervously here, front row. Just keep quiet and wrong. Um, and so this word, and so if you're talking about the big man, you can mean either someone who's very tall or someone who's very important. And so if you're talking about Stanlach Mua, you don't mean the very tall Stanley, you mean the very important Stanley. And so this has a wonderful, this gives a wonderful feature to Manx giants, that they suck into their number anyone who is of importance in Manx history. And so if we look at King Ori, this is a historically accurate depiction of the leader of the Norse here. He is, of course, seen as a giant. And so we hear about King Ori's grave in St. John's, which is just behind Timwall Hill there. And it's called the Giant's Grave, but to some people, still, it's known as King Ori's Grave. And this is the same sort of um, identification of King Ori as a giant, which happens on a few sites around the island. And likewise, if we talk about Mananin, who used to live at the top of South Barul here, then um, sometimes he is seen as a giant as well. Sometimes we hear that it's Mananin living on the top of South Rural. Sometimes we hear that it's a giant. And things get even more muddled, excellently so, I think. And so there's a story of um, Bulgan Bay, which is just south of the Dune or north of Laxey. And there's a rock in there which is explained by either King Ori throwing it there or a giant throwing, there, throwing it there but neither actually explain the name of the rock, which is Craig Benannan, or Menannan's Rock. And so clearly, in the folk memory, these three types of people, Menannan, King Ori, and a giant, are just merged together. But this, I think, 
is great and it reaches its highest point of confused brilliance, I think, in a story from George Borrow. And George Borrow was visiting the Isle of Man in the 1850s and he kept a very detailed diary of the people he met and the conversations he had. And so on the 23rd of August, 1855, he was here in Douglas Harbour. And he talks of meeting two or three rough-looking men like coal porters standing near a collier. One was a grimy, Herculean, bullet-headed fella, but instead we're going to hear from the ill-tempered-looking old man. Um, and he said, At one time, man was full of witches and wizards, and one of the kings of man was a wizard, and a famous one too, and a good friend of the country, for when enemies came to invade it, he would raise by art witchcraft such clouds and vapours that it was impossible for anybody to see it. He was a giant and had three legs, and they are his legs which you see on the side of the steamer, for those three legs of his are the arms of man. I believe he was called King Horry, said the old man, and, his, and he had a wife who knew as much witchcraft as himself, and he called her Ben McCree, which means woman of my heart. Well... They are both dead and gone now, but they are not altogether abaft, for two of our best steamer packets are called King Horry and Ben McCree. Which is a nice story, isn't it? <laughs> now, I think this is a great story for many reasons, but one of which is that it reflects that folklore is not top-down. It doesn't come from authority down to the people. It, it exists in the mess of community in the people all around us. And if we listen to it correctly, we can hear these sorts of um, grimy, bullet-headed chaps in these stories. And so the first aspect I'd like to point to is that folklore doesn't need to make sense. It doesn't need to all hang together. It doesn't need to be rational. It doesn't have to be non-conflicting. Because probably if it all makes sense, you're doing it wrong. And if you are making it all make sense, then you're going to be wiping out these sorts of stories which exist. Because the true Manx folklore exists in this confusion of the people. Character number two. Begins. Now we mentioned before about South Barul and how a giant once lived there. And we'll know about the Irish giant, Finn McCool. And of course he lived in the Isle of Man for a short while. And he too fought a... Well, he didn't fight a giant. When he was in Ireland, he fought a giant from Scotland. But here in the Isle of Man, he fought a Began. And the Began lived on the top of South Barul. And the Began, of course, was big, strong, aggressive, brutish and dangerous. And this is very like Begans as we all know them. And in fact, the best known Began is described as having a, a great big head covered with a mane of coarse black hair, with eyes like torches, glittering sharp tusks, fiery eyes glaring, a big ugly red mouth opened wide, and a dreadful voice. And of course this is a description of the Began which we know from Centrinians, yeah. Um, and most of us will know it from Sophia Morrison's telling of the Began of Centrinians. And, of course, we'll all know the story of the Began of Centrinians. Um, the Began didn't want this church finished, so he's blowing off the roof in the night time. And then a tailor said he took a bet that he would sow a pair of riches in the night in the church, which he did so. Just, and he finished it just as the Began appeared through the floor. And he leapt out the window, probably this window, just here, and he ran for his life with the Began after him. And he ran all the way to uh, St. Runius, where he leapt into the churchyard to safety, where the Began couldn't get him. And so in frustration, the Began ripped off his head and threw it at him, where it exploded in the graves behind the tailor. As you do. <laughs> um, and interestingly, it said that the tailor's scissors, which he used that night, are still with us. And they used to be in the pub just down the way from this until it closed not too long ago. Um, but the, this isn't the only type of began which is out there. 
If you go back to Sophia Morrison's time at the start of the 20th century, you'll find lots and lots of Bagan stories, many of which are in the book Ghosts, Bagans and Fairy Pigs, as you might be able to tell by the title. But the one I'll tell you now is from this stretch of the Lazare Road. If you can see in the background there, that is the TT Bridge. And so we are here between the two Ramsey Grammar School buildings. And this is the Crossigs Road here, going off to the Crossigs Farm. And this story is from A.M. Crellin, or she collected it, in 1893. And she writes, Margaret Esther Christian, an old woman living in Sulby, told me last week that one night she was coming from Ramsey late after midnight, when she was a girl of 17 years of age, and near the Crossigs Road she saw a figure in the road beside her which looped like a cat. But as she walked along, the figure also walked, and gradually it grew larger and larger, until it assumed the proportions of a big horse. And she ran along as fast as she could, and after a little time the figure, whatever it was, vanished, and she was very much alarmed. And this is a type of story which actually is quite, well, it's not uncommon in Manx literature or Manx folklore. This uh, small cat-like thing or dog-like thing which grows into a big air. And so the next time you're out late and you see a small dog or a cat, please don't kick it. <laughs> Just a warning for you. Um, but of course, this is not the only big air out there. There are also big airs which are perhaps even more strange there are ones which are like giant bulls with enormous horns. There are bear-like things. There are three-horned creatures with a head like a big pot. Or like one of the turf stacks the old men used to make. And these are all very strange. And there's very little connecting these types of begans. But that's as it should be. You should only be suspicious if begans are beginning to look alike. And this isn't actually a hidden thing. Because if you have read Sophia Morrison's Manx Fairy Tales cover to cover, you will know that um, in the preface she writes, she describes what Begans are, and she says, Begans are horrible and cruel creatures. They can appear in any, short, any shape they please, as ogres with huge heads, with great fiery eyes, or without any heads at all as small dogs who grow larger and larger as he watches them until they're larger than elephants, when perhaps they turn into the shape of men or disappear into nothing, as horn monsters or anything they choose. And this sort of shape-shifting, frightening sort of thing, in English today, we'd probably call them a monster. And that's why, in the Bunskull Gilgach, when they read this book, Where the Wild Things Are, they don't speak about monsters. They're speaking about begans here. And to me, this is the best illustration of what begans look like, how we should imagine begans. Because they're not all the same. They're all very different and very weird, but also very frightening, I think. Um, and this sort of way of talking about begans was very much with us until only relatively very recently. And there's a newspaper article which I think is very interesting in this sense. Because in the 1930s, a newspaper account appeared talking about a house which used to stand here. And I'd be very impressed if anyone knew what house stood in this field once upon a time. I'll give you a hint. It's about the gangs. Well, in the Peel City Guardian on the 20th of February 1932... This article appeared, and it's the centre one at the top there. The Dawlish Cashin began. And of course, this is about Jeff, the uh, Dawby spook or the talking mongoose. And I imagine that some of you down the back perhaps might not be able to read what it says here, and so I will uh, help you out. It says, and this is the first appearance of Jeff, the mongoose, in any of the island's newspapers, this article. And it says... From a lonely homestead situated high up on Dolby Mountain, there has, during the last few weeks, drifted into Peel weird and uncanny tales of bizarre happenings and strange noises emanating from within and about the farmhouse on Dawlish Cashin. 
The began, as we will call this creature which has set aflame the, f the fumes of fancy, has been seen in many forms and resembles many animals, principally of the feline species. With a body of a weasel or a cat, this is extremely doubtful, as he has been heard to say he has no stomach, and a pig's head with glowing eyes, hissing breath and a high-pitched voice, this is the apparition which has thrilled the neighbourhood. And so we often think of St Trinian's being the most famous began of all, but probably that began is topped by the chocolate-munching, pop-song-singing mongoose behind the wall of the Dawlish Cashin. And I rather like that, because if you understand the traditional, true sense of what a began is, it's right to have little Jeff as a part of the gang. And often Jeff gets a bad press, but maybe we should accept him as a true began in a traditional fashion. And so we get to folklore aspect number two, Boundaries or definitions can obscure the richness of the original. So just relax and just enjoy it. And then maybe you can start including a few strange mongooses talking behind the walls in our concept of traditional Manx folklore. And that's probably a good thing. The third character to be talking about are witches. And it's often said, or it's sometimes said, that there's no Manx word for witch. And this is not accurate. I much more prefer to think of it as being the case that there's no English word for what the Manx have, of course. <laughs> and I can prove this, and I can prove this very simply, because witch is a very rubbish word. We all know what a witch is. We all know they have pointy hats and fly around and broomsticks and do magic and the like. But that description doesn't even describe one of the most well-known witches in the tradition. And it's this one, the witch of Hansel and Gretel. And as we all know, this witch, parent witch, doesn't fly around. She doesn't do any magic. All she is is a woman who lives in the wilderness and eats children. <laughs> Can't blame her for that, can you? <laughs> But if you were a, um, a speaker of Manx 100, 200 years ago, you would recognise her as being a Kalyach. Because this is exactly what that witch is. It's an old woman who lives in the wilderness and eats people. Kalyach. And there are plenty of stories of Kalyachs in the Manx tradition. If you read the books like Carl Rauder's Manx, Ghosts, Begans, and Fairy Pigs. There's quite a few in there. And as I'm sure we are all listening to Annie Kissick's latest CD with her choir, Kurjan Kujak, we'll know that on there is a song called Derry Doan, which is about a woman who lives in the hills and mackled and eats things. Clearly a Kalyach. And also, in... Um, in the 1890s, one of my favourite stories is in of a Kalyak, and I'll read it to you, just to indulge myself, because I like it. And it's from this area of the world, Glen Chass, Fisted area. And it goes like this. There was a young man living in Fisted, and he was in Glen Chass Lodge one night until it was late. It was a fine, clear night, but rather windy, and he made across a little field in front of the house, and he saw something black beside the hedge, and thinking it was an article of clothing that had fallen on the bushes, he went towards it to lift it on again. But the thing got up of itself and was in the form of an old woman. And she came towards him, grinning fearfully and opening her mouth wide enough to swallow him. And he ran home fast and as fast as he could and was very bad for six to seven months after that. Correct reaction. Um, this is a wonderful story and this is a sort of story which exists of Kalyas in the Manx tradition but sadly we don't hear these enough probably because we don't have the word to accompany them and in fact there's one very obvious Kalyas which if you were Rams a Ramsey one you might know of this at Hop Chine time because there's a Ramsey song or it's from the north and this is a genuine Hop Chine song 
And in this song, Ginny does not fly around on a broomstick. She does not go over the house or lather any mouse mice. She just eats things. And it also has a lovely, unusual tune, which I might call upon Joe to sing us a verse or two from now. Hop tune, hop tune. Ginny the witch, she ate the horse, she ate the mane and the tail, of course. Hop tune, hop tune. Ginny the witch, she ate the cow, but how she ate it, I don't know how. Hop tune, hop tune. If you're gonna give us something, give us it soon. We want to be home with the light of the moon. Hop tune, hop tune. And as you can see, um, Ginny eats things. She eats the horse, the cow, the sheep, the hog, the dog, uh, the ringy and the mouse. And Ginny the witch, she'll soon be in view. And if you're not careful, she'll eat you too. And so if you and Ramsay are around hot Ginny time and a bunch of lads come to the door and offer to chase her out for a penny, I'd suggest you give her the penny because it's probably a good deal up there. And so that's the Kalyuch wandering around the wilderness eating people. That's just one of the meanings hidden underneath this one blunt English word, witch. And another thing hiding underneath that is the fur obby. And the fur obby is the person of the doings, someone who does stuff. And this is a charmer or someone who in the pre-modern medicine world, you, if something had gone wrong in your life, you would go to them and they would put it right. And this is, includes medical things, but it's also veterinary things and things more general. They would do a charm and put it right or to make things go more your way. And charms is a key word because it's more charms than spells. These people are not doing magic. They are dealing with a part of the natural world. And so they are not doing supernatural things. They're just dealing with the far end of the natural world and doing it with an expertise which you or I probably don't have. And this use of, and this influencing of the supernormal part of the world is not good or evil. And it's very much like in the normal world around us, I can move a chair and that's not good or bad. If I move a chair into your shin, that's probably bad. And if I move a chair for you to sit on, that's probably good. And in the same way, in this uh, super normal part of the world, it's, it's not necessarily good or bad. You're just dealing with things in that part of the world. And this is shown nicely in dealing about luck. And luck is the word I'm using to talk about flourishing or things going well with you. But we don't really have that word in English, so I'll just go with luck. And if we think today about luck, we imagine it as this bottomless pit of stuff, which you kind of hope to get some luck to yourself for. But 200 years ago, 100 years ago, you wouldn't have that idea of luck. You would see luck as a finite thing. And so if you were getting luck, you'd be getting it from somewhere else. And this is illustrated really nicely with a story about the morning of Lair Balden, the first day of May. And it's said in a number of books excuse me, that you can go out on the morning of Lair Balden and collect in the dew of the grass and wash yourself in it to bring yourself good luck, which all sounds very nice and positive. But if you look in the church presentments of the 18th century, you will find people in court for doing this because they're not just doing it in any old field, they're doing it in their neighbours' fields and they're, going, they're doing it to take the luck from their neighbours. And of course, these people are being tried for what is called witchcraft in the trials. And they are being convicted for witchcraft for doing this. But it would have been known as butcherach. And this is where the idea that there isn't a Manx word for witch comes from. Because in this, you see butch, which is the loan word from English. Butch and witch are the same sort of word. But it isn't the same thing because it fits in this different understanding of the world. And the key thing about butcherach 
is, is defined as bad. And so what you are doing, if you do butcherach, is that you are diminishing the luck of someone else. This is necessarily a bad thing. And so you would never say, I am a butch, I am doing butcherach, unless you are threatening someone. This is necessarily a bad thing. And it's kind of counter, counterposed by the fur obi. And so things would go wrong for you because of butcherach, and it would be put right, or you'd be protected from it by the fur obi. Just different people working this space of the natural world differently. And the key, and the thing about butcherach is that you are concerned about people doing butcherach, because there's no distinction between any of us and anyone can do butcherach. You just need to, to do it. And so you don't need to be specially qualified. You don't need to join a league with the devil to do it. You don't need to be a witch. You don't need to be a butch. You just need to do butcherach. Very simple things. And so I'm sure we all have a crush kern over our doors to keep away evil spirits and the like, especially on Evalden before the start of May. And we're sometimes told that this is to keep witches away. But of course, this isn't real. This is as silly as it sounds. You're not really keeping witches from flying into your house and doing whatever they want to do. Really what you're doing is protecting people doing butcherach and taking the luck out of your home. And so this is a protection to keep the luck inside your home for the year ahead. And so here we get the four types of being which are hidden under that one rubbish English word. You have the witch with a pointy hat and a broomstick. And there are stories of witches in the Isle of Man. They stick out like a sore thumb. They're clearly imported and they're not as good as the Kaliak story. Kaliaks exist in the wilderness and eat people. The butch is someone who does butcherach, take away your luck, and the fur of protects it or gives it back. And I think what's important about all these is that these are all being hidden under that one English word. And with the onslaught, some might say, of the Anglo-American Halloween and the like, it's quite clear that these sorts of distinctions are being buried, are being more, taken away from us more. And so we get to aspect number three. We have a responsibility to our folklore. Because if we're not going to keep it alive, then no one else is going to do it for us. And of course, Manx folklore is something which shouldn't just be in books. It should be with us as Manx people and in the landscape of the Isle of Man. And so we have a responsibility to keep it alive and to educate ourselves and to pass on these stories if we have them. The fourth character is the little fellas or themselves or the fairies. Now, if I was going to tell you that I was doing, going to tell you a fairy story, you might not expect the story which I have prepared here. And it's, um, it has a little bit of Manx in, which will hopefully make this row blush a little. And if you don't understanding, understand it, hopefully you will capture the meaning from the context. Two young lads were travelling away after courting. And coming across the fields, they saw a light in a house. And they went to the door. And there was music and dancing and wonderful things and drinking and cups going round. One of them was pulled out to dance with the rest. And they were going on wonderful with the one he danced with. And the other fellow wanted to moon. And he went outside and did so against the house. And as soon as he'd done this, Vaku, whoosh, the house and all was gone. And the one inside gone too, sir. In the course of seven years, this other fella was coming home the same fields and he sees the light the same way as before and he went in and there was the company all dancing on the floor regular and so he looked on a while how the performance was going on and it was said he went to the fella, his companion, and told him to come out. He wanted to talk to him and he went out and he said, why in the world did he come so soon? And he, and he took hold of him and ran Ustia on the house and on the man. And as soon as he'd done that, sure, sir, all was gone. And the chap had been dancing away for seven years. If I'd said that I was going to tell you a, a, a story about the fairies in which everyone gets urinated on, 
then probably you might not believe me, but these stories exist and they're excellent. Um, and you'll get from this story the idea that, ooh, didn't expect that one. <laughs> the idea that the little fellas are dangerous and threatening and of the night time. And this is true to all Manx fairy tales. Um, there are stories of the woman in Bride who was punched awake by the little fellas. They punched her in the eye to wake her up to make, her cake, to make them some cake because she'd forgotten it before she went to bed. Or there's the story of the lost wife of Balalise where they steal the wife from the farmer near St John's. And one account of the story has her murdered by the little fellas on the threshold of the barn. Or, of course, there's many changeling stories where the little fellas come and steal the baby and replace it by a baby who will just cry and shout for years and years. And there are even some parents such as myself who believe that this is probably still with us, but <laughs> yet to be determined. And, of course, with these sorts of stories, there's no space for benevolent young flying girls with wings. And, of course, this has nothing to do with the Manx tradition. And at this point is when I show this slide of the fairy bridge. And, of course, as we all know, the little fellas are all around us in the Isle of Man, so there's no doubt that they are indeed at the fairy bridge. However, a lot of us will be aware that this is not the real fairy bridge. The real fairy bridge is 200 metres up the road at Balona, or Balalona, if you want to say it like that. It's this bend in the road. There is a bridge. If you were to go slowly, you'd see that you go over a river. And this is what was known as the Ferry Bridge until the 1960s, when they moved it up the road for reasons of tourism, because that's easier to see and take a picture of. And they put a sign up. It's a nice sign, isn't it? But if you look back in the earliest records I can find of the Ferry Bridge here at Bologna, it's this from H.A. Bullock's History of the Isle of Man from 1816. And she writes, Balalona Bridge, usually called the Devil's Bridge, which is said to be the scene of his satanic majesty's frequent exploits, on which account it is with extreme reluctance that the natives venture over it after dark. Which I think is fascinating. The fact that the little fellas can morph from this idea of the devil or the jowl being here, and within 200 years, or even 100 years, we can forget that, and we form them into being the little fellas, and soon enough we forget it, and begin to think of them as benevolent young girls with wings. But, so who are the little fellas, the true Manx little fellas? Well, they're like us, but different. They wore clothes, just like us, of course, they wore jackets and caps, which would have been true to the Manx fashion 150, 200 years ago, but they were different. And so, so instead of being normal colours, they were bright uh, green or red. And they socialised in communities, but out in lonely hilltops or in remote glens. And they went fishing, but invisibly. They went hunting, but at night. And they ate and drank, but the cows that they ate in the night would be there in the stall in the morning. Or well, there's a lovely story of two fellas coming back and finding two little fellas eating in their front room. And then through the windows, they see them regurgitate the food onto the plate. And so these lads go in, and one of them says, oh, I don't fancy the food now, and leaves it. And the other one says, oh, well, actually, the little fellas have produced it, so I'm going to eat it. And sure enough, it was the fella who didn't eat his food who fell ill soon after that and was in a bad way. So, if you ever see little fellas regurgitating food, <laughs> have confidence and tuck in. Um, and they also lived in houses like us, but underground. And of course, this is the fairy hill outside Port Erin. And it's um, well known to Manx tradition that the little fellas live underground. And this is not the only fairy hill in the Isle of Man, there's plenty. And, and back 100, 200 years ago, this was thought to be a round mound. So this is thought to be a place of the dead. And so it was thought that the little fellas lived in this place of the dead. And this is illustrated nicely in a story from Lonnon, where a fella had his house 
um, plagued by the little fellas. They'd come each night and put it all through her. They'd, they'd make a right mess. And this went on and on nightly until they built the tram in the 1890s or 80s, whenever it was. And when they dug up the back end of his garden, they uncovered lots of gravestones and they took out the bones and took them away. And from that point on, the little fellas no longer plagued his house at night time. So, the little fellas are like us but different. They are unpredictable and dangerous. They are like us but kind of the dark side of who we are. And so we are naturally wary of them. And this wariness gives us the many names we have for them. And so names like Slyberger, Munjaberger, the little fellas, themselves, the crowd, the mob, them that's in. And of course, none of these are actual names. All of these are just a nod and a wink, just to say, you know, those ones. We're not going to name them, but just the, the little fellas. And this is because <coughs> there's no good in naming them. Because if you were to name them, nothing good is going to come of it. They, might, they are going to be listening and they will hear you. And so if you're going to talk about them, you'll want to talk about them in code like this. And so the caution forbade the everyday use of their right name. And what we see emerging in these sort of this understanding of the little fellas is that the world in, we, in which we occupy, the world, our island, and even our homes are a shared space, that these are not spaces which we are in control of. They are also other people's. And we are accountable in community, but also to these extra powers beyond our ken to how we live our lives and how we use the land around us. And I think this is a wonderful thing to realise. And we will miss this if we just understand the little fellas as benevolent girls with wings. And so we get folklore aspect number four. Folklore should be respected because these traditions are our traditions. They talk about Manx things. And if we interpret these in a way which make people in the past seem stupid or childish, then we are not doing it justice. And we need to understand it in the correct way so that we can understand who we are as Manx people and the stories around which we live all our lives. Now, the fifth folklore aspect, I could have talked about Fenordaries or the Tarurustia or the Lian and Shi or the Mordadu or mermaids or any of the number of interesting ghosts which exist in the Manx tradition. Now, some of those are too broad or too narrow, too deep or too shallow. And so I find far more interesting stories like this one. Um, this is from Carl Rorder. Again, it's from Ghosts, Begins and Fairy Pigs. It is this big stack of fire. Some men were going home from Port St. Mary about one o'clock on Saturday night and saw a great big stack of fire coming in from the sea. And they heard some drunken fellas quarrelling and fighting at the four roads at the time. And this stack of fire went towards the place where they were fighting and disappeared. And the row was over. And that's that. I haven't edited that. No more is there. I have no idea what it's about. It's an open-ended story which fits no pattern I know of. It is inexplicable and, importantly, in some sense, pointless. It just is. And this, there's lots of other stories like this, such as the two white serpents in the how. Enormous white serpents slither along the road, and then they go into someone's garden, and then they come back out and slither off up the road. And nothing else happens. And it's this wonderful pointlessness of these stories which I find so fascinating. Because it shows that these are genuine stories. Because if you were collecting these stories, then not as good collectors probably wouldn't write them down. Or they would edit them to have a beginning and a middle and an end. Or you would probably save some paper and not put it in your publication. But it's exactly because these are so terrible, we know they're true. Because if you're making up this story, you would do it better. 
And so we know that these are genuine stories which were told genuinely in the Manx context, and then you can know to trust some collectors' other stories off the back of these. Um, and some of these stories are very important to collect, and this is one which I find particularly interesting. Um, it was published at the start of the 20th century about a big wheel of fire. A man, when he was young, was seeing the girls home late in the night, and when coming to the end of a bare and clacked glass, the greystone road, he heard great noise, and he looked in every direction but could see nothing, and the noise was coming nearer. He did not know what to do, and so he got over the hedge, but the noise was just over him, and he looked up and saw a big thing like a wheel of fire. It was going round at a great speed, and it went towards Balakurri, and when it was near that place, it vanished, and he saw no more of it. Now, I think this sounds undisputably like a UFO story, I would say. And here, undisputably, is an alien on a cross from Mackled. <laughs> Glad you laughed at that. Um, and this is... I think this is remarkable, because this story was first published on the 15th of November, 1902, when there was no concept of aliens or UFOs. And so this story wasn't told as a UFO story. This was just told as a, this strange thing happened. And in fact, this is only the second... UFO story in the British Isles. The first one, out of interest, was from Hull in 1801. And so this is a very remarkable story from the Isle of Man. And it's interesting because folklore is always said to be on the point of death, but it never is. Folklore is always with us and it's always changing. And so I said before about keeping the Manx folklore alive, but we also need to be open to new forms of folklore. We need to um, listen and respect and retell and pass on the stories which we hear. And so we get to folklore aspect number five. Folklore is not dead. And it's a part of us and our jobs on the earth, I think, to tell and retell and to help today's folklore be passed on to tomorrow. And together, these five aspects, I think, add up to quite a nice attitude to folklore in the Isle of Man. Because folklore doesn't need to make sense. Boundaries or definitions can obscure the richness of the original. And we have a responsibility to our folklore. Folklore needs to be respected. And folklore is not dead. Because to me, folklore is a part of us. And it's a part of this wonderful Isle of Man. And if we want it to be here into the future, we should do our bit to help it be. Good evening.